Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so we are about to start our invited talk at this hour. My name is Chang Yang. I'm from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, today, we are very happy to have J.L. Pinu to uh, give us an invited talk on uh, improving healthcare through AI. Uh, J.L. is a, a, a very uh, well-known and uh, 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 researcher in planning as well as machine learning. Uh, she has done uh, very significant work in PalmDP and reinforcement learning. Uh, she graduated from uh, CMU in 2004, and she's now a McGill University uh, professor. And her work uh, not only contributes to the theory uh, and algorithmic study of uh, uh, PalmDP and uh, reinforcement learning, but also in practical applications in healthcare, uh, which we, we will hear today, as well as robotics and uh, a number of other very interesting topics. So uh, let's welcome uh, uh, JL. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, the introduction. Um, and please, those of you who are sitting in the back, don't hesitate to come down. It's a very large room. Um, but this is a little bit of an intimate talk about research. I've subtitled it a story of small and slow research because in many ways this is the type of research that we carry out when we tackle the use of AI these days to help improve healthcare treatment. Um, and it's going to be a departure from what we hear about a lot these days. We've all seen the big headlines, eye-catching things um, about how AI is going to revolutionize the workforce, the way we live, the way we move. In many cases, the headlines are accompanied with some of these words, right? We're in this area of big data and there's going to be an AI revolution and all of this will lead us straight into the glorious future. Um, and for many of us, this really seems like a hype and there's a gap between the kind of work that we conduct in our lab with our graduate students on a daily basis and the headlines that we are seeing. And I would like to essentially talk about research that has a very different flavor than that. Research that tries to use the best of what we've come up with in terms of AI models, algorithms, architecture, but really try to tackle problems where we don't have big data and maybe where we won't necessarily take on the world. And despite the fact that in some cases we have small data, we're still going to try to be bold about the problems that we pick. We're going to try to see through the use of the most innovative technology in AI how we can solve important problems to improve the quality of care, the type of treatments that are provided, who has access to this treatment in a meaningful way. And so in this case, I think we want to really think about how do we do small and slow research. And so in this, I will present a few case studies of how to do that for healthcare. In many um, applications of what I will discuss, there will be a combination of several technologies from artificial intelligence. I talk about how to incorporate reinforcement learning, which is about control and decision making, how to incorporate perception, which deals with incorporating data from complex sources of information. Um, I also talk about how to do that in the context of learning algorithms because there has been real breakthroughs in terms of machine learning, um, but many cases are not adapted to the reality of the kinds of problems we're dealing with in healthcare. And so I will try to draw on this expertise that we've developed in my lab around reinforcement learning, combine these new ideas, and try to tackle a few specific problems. Um, there will be a few characters showing up throughout this talk. Um, none of them are, or very few of them will be eminent scientists. Um, many of them are going to be mere rodents. It turns out that they have a very useful role to play when we want to start thinking about how to apply AI for improvement treatment of healthcare. Um, these are cases where we don't necessarily have simulators, where we don't have large data sets. And so these rodents provide a very useful model of the environment that we are trying to look at, in which we can explore the ideas on the table. The first place where these 
rodents um, appear is really at the onset of this research, which is based on reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is inspired by several decades of study by behavioral psychology, where, you, where the study tackled the problem of how do animals learn through a combination of observing their environment, making decisions, and observing the outcomes of these decisions. And so in this case, Psychologists formulated models whereby through a combination of rewards and punishments, the behavior of the animals could be shaped. And these very nice concepts were then recuperated into a more computational theory of reinforcement learning. So a lot of the seminal work in reinforcement learning started, as many of you know, in the 1980s, seminal contributions by Andy Bartow, by Rich Sutton. It's probably fitting that uh, this year Andy Bartow is a recipient of the Ichikai Award for Research Excellence. Um, the work that they have done has really propelled the field forward. And so in the reinforcement learning framework, there's a formalism in terms of the model where we assume that the system that we are trying to model and control, whether it's a rodent, whether it's a robot, is actually modeled by a set of dynamics. These dynamics can be phrased in terms of a probabilistic model. And this probabilistic model essentially explains how the system evolves over time, both the dynamics that are subject to um, factors influenced by the environment, but also by decisions of the agent. So there's a combination between these environmental factors and these agent-controlled um, actions which together predict where the system, how the system is going to evolve over time. And so there's information about the environment that has to be captured. We usually call this the state. You can think of the state as a sufficient statistic for the information contained in the environment, the information that the agent's going to use. And we're most interested in finding a strategy, often we denote this with a pi, the strategy that explains the best decision-making strategy for the agent. And so the strategy should ideally lead to as much reward as possible, acquisition of cheese if you're a mouse, and satisfaction of task if you're a robot. And these kinds of models have been used in many, many different domains in recent years. Um, perhaps most well known is the work that's been done in robotics, where the reinforcement learning framework has been common going back a couple decades. But if we look at papers, these are all taken from recent publications in the last year of applications of reinforcement learning, and the spectrum is really quite interesting. Of course, medical intervention, which is what I'm going to talk about today, but also applications for resource management, conversational systems, improvisational theater, who would have thought, um, prosthetic arm control, and several, several more. And so if you're interested in figuring out how widely reinforcement learning has gone, um, it's worth looking into the recent literature. These are just drawn from the proceedings of the reinforcement, le reinforcement learning and decision-making RLDM conference from last June. Um, probably the largest success story of reinforcement learning, the one we've all heard about last year, was the development of the AlphaGo system by Google DeepMind, which went on to win in a spectacular fashion against the best human Go players. Um, it's worth noting that the research that was done in AlphaGo is very impressive, quite a fantastic achievement. It's not really small and slow research. So this is AI with a capital A, with a capital I. They had, I think, 30 million examples um, of moves from human games that they could use to train the system. They used about 1,200 GPUs, sorry, 1,200 CPUs, 200 GPUs, um, and pumped all of this data together. And so while it's tremendously impressive, um, it's not clear that the technology that was applied in this context is necessarily the same kinds of models and algorithms that we can use when trying to use reinforcement learning to improve our decision-making in healthcare system. I would be very hard-pressed to find an interesting decision-making problem in a clinical context where I'm going to have access to 30 million data points. Um, and so most of the time, I'm looking at a handful of data points. You will be surprised how small the numbers are um, as we go through this talk. And so we have to rethink, essentially, what is the space of representations that we consider rethink what are the algorithms that are going to be performing, and rethink essentially how we measure our performance in this case. 
And so one of the projects on which I've been uh, quite active over the last decade is in collaboration with researchers at the Montreal Neurological Institute. Um, this is a university hospital affiliated with McGill University and has a long history of um, looking at improving treatment and doing research in epilepsy, going back to the early days of uh, Wilder Penfield, who pioneered much of the research on epilepsy treatment. So for those of you who are maybe perhaps not familiar with epilepsy, it's actually a very common, one of the most common disorders of the nerve, nervous system. Um, it affects about 1% of the world population. The causes are quite varied, sometimes due to a predisposition, sometimes due to a brain injury, a tumor. Um, in many ways, seizures are very difficult to predict and they're very difficult to control. And to this day, epilepsy is still diagnosed mostly through the symptoms, by observing the data, in most cases through EEG data, observing the data to determine the prevalence of the, or the existence of the condition. Um, it's not diagnosed through biomarkers or other techniques. And so if we look at what the data looks like, this is an example of a particular incidence of a seizure. You see the strong deflection in the middle from the EEG signal. Um, it's, some of them are visually um, easy to assess, even without uh, medical training. Um, in other cases, the variability in terms of the symptoms is quite large. Um, and so when it, people looking at this kind of data, electrophysiologists get trained, Often it's an apprenticeship through over time. Some of the cases, the easy cases, they pick out soon and then they consult with colleagues and there's some discussion. In many cases, if we have data from EEG from people with epilepsy that is annotated by specialists, there's going to be disagreement in the annotations. And so in this case, what I'm interested in isn't necessarily just in annotating the data using machine learning techniques, but really in trying to figure out how we can reduce the incidence of seizures in individuals. Now, the first line of treatment for most individuals with epilepsy is um, pharmacological. We have some um, medication that is effective for about 75% of people who suffer from epilepsy. Um, for the people who don't respond to the medication or for whom the medication um, doesn't sufficiently reduce their symptoms, um, the second line of um, treatment for many years has been surgery, resection surgery, where essentially surgeons go in and remove a particular section of the brain as you can imagine, this is a terribly invasive procedure that carries high risk, both of long-term damage as well as complication. And so there's been a lot of interest in recent years in the I'd say, in, in third treatment option related to neurostimulation. And in this case, we're using a particular device which is connected to the brain. And in real time, we can apply electrical stimulation to sections of the brain and the hypothesis is that when we apply the stimulation quite locally to a small group of neurons, we essentially, by stimulating in that area, provoke some disturbance in terms of the firing patterns of the neurons. And so in epilepsy, often what happens is several of the neurons essentially are firing in a synchronous fashion. There's hypersynchronization of the system that provokes the seizure. And so in this case, in neurostimulation, when you're applying the stimulation, you force this nearby neurons to fire, which then propagates forces other neurons to fire in the system. So you're essentially disturbing their ability to coordinate and uh, produce a seizure. And so in this particular case, it's a very promising technology. Compared to drug therapy, it's much more localized. Drug therapy acts on the whole brain. And so even though seizure initiation may be localized, it acts quite globally, not just on the brain, on the whole system. In this case, it's possible to apply the treatment um, in a local manner close to where the seizure initiation center might be. But because it's a new treatment, there's a lot of questions about how it should be applied. You're dealing with an electrical signal, and so you can change many different things. Where the stimulation is delivered, what's the intensity of the stimulation, what's the timing of the pulse. In the example I'm showing here, it's a case of periodic stimulation, so the stimulation is applied at regular intervals. There's a lot of question in the community about what are the right parameters for doing that. And so in this particular context, we started working with researchers at the Montreal Neurological Institute specifically on this question. Could we find a better way to optimize the timing of the stimulation in a responsive manner? So alternate the timing as a function of the activity in the brain using real-time analysis of the signal.
In this particular case, we don't have a very good computational model of the human brain, at least not at the level that can be used to test out this. And so we turned to an animal model of epilepsy that had been already widely used in our partner lab. In this particular case, we are looking at rat, uh, brain slices from rats. These slices incorporate several substructure around the hippocampus. And so in this case, we place a recording electrode in the intraorinal cortex, a stimulating electrode in the subiculum. And the goal is to see if in this particular model, we can actually use reinforcement learning to optimize the parameters, in particular, the timing of the neurostimulation strategy. And so it's a convenient model in that it's relatively safe compared to applying this directly on humans. Um, the model has been established for a long time in the literature. Uh, however, there's still some differences between these in vitro models and human models. And so it's a simpler model compared to the human physiology for epilepsy. But still, the model had been used um, in the epilepsy community for a long time before we started this collaboration and was judged to be a good quality model. And furthermore, we had something really useful for this particular model. And that is, we already had an idea of some strategies that were effective for reducing stimulation. And this is a really powerful type of information. For those of you, if you go back and look at how the AlphaGo system was implemented, right, the first thing they did is learn a controller policy using these 30 million human games, essentially doing imitation learning with a body of um, actions that you know are good. And so in this model, we had something akin to that in that there was already demonstration that periodic frequency stimulation at certain frequencies was effective. So at least it gives us some constraints on the space of policies that we can look at. In particular, it turns out for this model that stimulation at one hertz, so pinging the brain every second, seemed to be a good way to disturb the synchronization to the point that you could essentially have a system that was seizure free whereas previously seizures in this system were occurring on the order of every minute or two. And so in the case of adaptive neurostimulation, really um, we're interested in figuring out if we can improve the efficacy. In this case, one hertz stimulation gives you essentially um, optimal efficacy in that it tone, tones down the seizures completely. And so the secondary question was whether we could actually reduce the, in, the number of stimulation we applied. And so we had a combined objective of fully reducing seizures while minimizing the amount of stimulation that's delivered. And there's a few reasons why that's a good idea in terms of minimizing stimulation. Some of the, on the one part, you want to preserve the quality of the tissue as much as possible. On the other part, when this is actually going to be implemented, you want to preserve battery life, reduce power usage, and so on. And so we have a joint objective. In this case, we're literally using this animal model. <clears throat> and from the animal model, we read the EG signal in real time, we observe what activity is going on, we have a computer that's plugged into the system, that computer analyzes a real-time signal, chooses an action, stimulate or not, in real time, using the latest information. And so the policy space, the action space, is just whether to stimulate or not. In the reinforcement learning formulation for this problem, there's three phases, essentially, to consider. The first one is data acquisition. Though we have an animal model that gives us a lot of flexibility about how we acquire the data, um, we can't do anything we want. And so it's much more efficient in this case if we can reduce the space of policies that we are going to consider. These models are difficult um, to uh, prepare. It takes a long time. You'll probably notice here I have an N of eight. So that means I had eight slices from which to learn my optimal strategy. These slices are active for about three to four hours, and during that time you have a seizure every few minutes or so. And so in terms of quantity of data that we have to learn from, it's relatively small. Uh, fortunately, the slices are reasonably uniform, so what you learn on one slice um, is somewhat coherent with what you'll see on the other slice, but still very small amount of data. Um, the, the other thing is, if you consider this type of work, is frankly quite experimental and so when you know I had the first discussions with the colleagues in epilepsy and explained you know what we were trying to do using this reinforcement learning and we were going to plug in a computer into their animal model they had a healthy amount of skepticism they said okay we can give you a couple slices on the side right but this was like the Friday afternoon kind of research project they weren't going to dedicate huge resources to this and when you write the grant for the granting agency and say 
you know, that you want to do this. There, there's a little bit of skepticism. So you have to start doing this kind of on the small, on the side, and see what you get out of this. And one result of that is that if you can use data that is collected for other purposes to train your system, then that makes it a lot easier to convince your partners to do that. So in this case, they had already collected a lot of data. So I say when I have n equals eight, that's my training data. This is data that they had actually already collected using their periodic strategy. So we weren't allowed to do full exploration in this. We we're using data from these previously collected slices to train our system. We said, just give us the data. We'll train our computer using that. And then give us a few more slices to test out how well our reinforcement learning system is doing. And so from the training data, we extracted information. Our state representation is based on a combination of um, basic signal processing features in this case. So Fourier transform information, range, power, and so on. The policy space we're considering, because our training data was based on these fixed frequency protocol, and the fixed frequency essentially for a particular period of time, you're always stimulating at one hertz, and then you always stimulate at two hertz, and so on. And so because we were doing that, the policy that we can consider is essentially switching between these fixed strategies. So our choice of action is either keep on the same periodic strategy or switch to a different periodic strategy. So we have the switching strategy and the cost function is a combination of reducing seizure and reducing stimulation overall. So taking all of this training data together, the next step is actually to estimate a value function for applying particular actions in particular state. And so this value function for, should essentially, as per the basic principles of reinforcement learning, this is essentially a form of the Bellman equation, which is familiar to anyone who's read the first few chapters of the uh, Sutton and Bardo textbook. This particular case, the Q function gives us this expected reward over the cumulative life of the system. And so we're interested in minimizing the immediate costs, so that's a fixed cost for stimulation, and the long-term cost, which is whether or not a seizure is going to ensue from that point on. In this case, we estimated this Q function using regression algorithm. For a regression algorithm, we didn't pick anything very fancy. We went with random forests. And the main reason we did this is because they tend to be very, very robust to hyperparameter specification. And so when you're dealing with this kind of system, you can't afford to have a large data set. You can't afford to do a lot of cross-validation to carefully pick all of your hyperparameters. So in this case, having the kind of system that is robust to hyperparameter specification, that has few hyperparameters, tends to be very, very useful. So we used random forest using a Bellman loss um, to train the regression algorithm. And the last piece of the system was really the control policy that we extract. So we take our Q function and at each state of the system in real time, we take the EG data, we actually extract the state of the system, we look up which is the action that has between our different switching policy, which is the action that has the best um, expected value. We apply this action. And so what I'm showing down here is an example of one of these period of one of these adaptive strategies. This is what it looks like. On top I have the EEG signal. This is from a real um, animal slice in the lab. And in this case, in the phase over here where you see a beginning of a deflation, you see that the policy actually accelerates the number of stimulation that is applied. And later on, when the system actually this the synchronization has been sufficiently disturbed, we see that the stimulation is actually spaced out because the system is analyzing that essentially the synchronization can't occur at that point. There's been sufficient depletion of some of the neurotransmitters in here. And so there's really a sense that it changes over time. If you had asked a clinician to set the parameters for neurostimulation, none of them would come up with a policy that has these kinds of characteristic that changes over time. The complexity of the policy is just too high compared to the type of strategies that humans can express. And so once we had trained the system, we had agreed with our partners that we would get a few slices for validation set. And so we had 11 different animals that we could use for validating um, the particular strategy that we had learned from the training data. And what we found when we went ahead and validated on these 11 animals is we found that in terms of on the left side over here, we see the efficacy in terms of reducing the seizure. So we're essentially as good, a little bit better, but statistically as good as the one hertz 
strategy, which is known to essentially re reduce the seizures down to zero in this animal model, but we have signif significantly better um, performance in terms of reducing the amount of stimulation that we need to apply. And so, if I can sort of synthesize a couple take-home points from this particular case, really, I would say that if you're interested in doing this kind of work, it's really worth thinking about what are the right models to do this work in. And I use the word model very broadly here, in particular for dynamic systems, right? Models can be animal models, it can be computational models, it can be the real physical plant in which you tend to operate, but you need to think carefully where your data is going to come from. And in many cases, in particular for dynamic systems, it's hard in the first round to convince people to do reinforcement learning in the real target system. And so you need to think about simpler system where it's possible to do this. Um, once we had these preliminary results, we were interested in seeing whether we could carry out the analysis in um, in vivo models, so live animal models with epilepsy. Um, things get a little bit more complicated in this case. Um, there's much larger variance in seizures. Um, seizures are much more infrequent, so an animal may go several days without a seizure, so there's serious data imbalance challenges. Um, usually there's multiple channels through which the recordings are taken. Um, perhaps most difficult in this case is the fact that, frankly, we are n not aware of any open loop strategies that is quite as effective. So just in terms of initial data collection, it's much harder to think of how we will collect data in an efficient way without requiring very, very large number of animals. And so when faced with a difficult problem like that, um, one of the things that's useful to do is kind of step back and target a more limited version of the problem. And so in this particular case, we looked specifically at whether we could find at least a good representation in this case. So in the SLICE model, we used a single channel. Um, we had some reasonably robust features to analyze the channel and get our state representation. In the multiple channel case, we started looking at whether we could just get a good representation for seizure detection. And in this case, there's quite a few um, reasonably good data set that can be used um, to do seizure detection automatically from data. So we didn't even have to use animal data, we could use human data for that. And there's also a very, um, a very common protocol for deciding where the electrodes are placed spatially. And so that means that from one patient to the other, if the protocol is, follow is followed, you actually have a reading of where the electrodes are placed. And of course, you have the temporal information from the recording. And there was a recent result last year um, that showed how to converge multi-channel EEG to essentially an image representation. And the nice part of doing this is that you're essentially taking your multi-dimensional time signal you're representing it as an image, not because it's an image, but because once you have it represented as an image, there's many things we know how to do in terms of analyzing images. And so in this particular case, the image incorporates both the frequency information and it incorporates the spatial information. And you can concatenate several images and when you do that, you have the frequency information, the spatial information, and the time information all together. And so to do this, um, we used the representation, the image representation that had been proposed by um, uh, previous authors, and we incorporated that using both a convolutional neural network architecture to analyze each image separately, and the output of that convolutional architecture was forced into a recurrent architecture that allows the time sequence to be taken into account. So this recurrent convolutional architecture is something that a year or two ago was not um, very common, but now has become, in the last year or so, become more common for analysis of medical signal because it allows to incorporate together this frequency, spatial, and time information all together. And so using this representation, um, we looked at some of the standard data sets for doing seizure prediction. Um, the first data set we looked at was doing patient-specific classification. I mentioned briefly that when you're dealing with uh, live animals or humans, 
the profile, the type of seizure that you see changes a lot from one individual to the other. So in this case, we have a few seizures observed from each patient, and we try to build a predictor for that patient specifically without sharing data between different patients. Um, this is results showing essentially how better or worse we do when we use this recurrent convolutional architecture compared to a more classical machine learning architecture. And the classical machine learning architecture is a mixture of um, features extracted using standard signal processing techniques thrown into a support vector machine, and you train that with your data. And so what we see, you know, on some patients we do better, on some patients we do worse. It's not so clear that the recurrent convolutional architecture is much better in this case. And the two metrics we looked at are both improvement in sensitivity, so our ability to detect seizures when it's present, but also an improvement in terms of false positive rate, which is a major factor with some of these automatic detection systems. They tend to do great. They detect all the seizures, but they have very, very high false positive rates. And having a system with high false positive rate um, can lead to many false alarms and overstimulation in some cases. Um, so these results were, you know, not so conclusive. Um, but then we started looking at new patient classification. So how well do we do when we have a new patient that comes in for whom we don't have any data, and we must build a classifier for this new patient based on the previous patient we've seen so far? And what we see is that the recurrent um, recurrent convolutional architectures compared to some of the more classical machine learning methods, even with small amounts of data, are much better. In this case, we're dealing with data from 24 patients. This is a data set that was um, produced by researchers at MIT in conjunction with some, one of the Boston hospitals. Um, and so in this case, 24 patients, and still we're able to detect um, seizures in new patients with much better sensitivity, much improvement in terms of false positive rates. So that was reasonably encouraging. Um, in reinforcement learning, in a sense, you're often dealing with a new um, system because as you're changing the policy for your stimulation, you're essentially changing the distribution of the data that you're seeing. Right? As the policy changes, it induces different patterns in the brain. And so having the ability to transfer to slightly different dynamic system is really quite important. Um, the other thing that was quite nice with this particular recurrent convolutional architecture is what happens when you start losing part of your signal. For one reason or another, when you have these multi-channel readings, often one channel will disappear, it will drop off, it will um, start putting in noise. And what we saw is if you had, in this case, it's a system with, I believe, 32 channels. Um, if you're losing five or six channels, quickly your classical methods uh, fall significantly in terms of performance. This graph is in terms of your, the AOC curve. Um, if, however, you use a recurrent convolutional architecture, there's really good robustness to missing channels um, using raw data plus this recurrent convolutional architecture. And so this is also quite promising in terms of generalizing to new system. So maybe distilling a little bit um, what's happening here, I would say if you don't have a lot of data, choosing your representation carefully matters a lot. And in some cases, I mean, this is something that many people who've worked in AI are very familiar with. Um, I would say perhaps even more so when dealing with um, real-world data, thinking about alternate ways to represent the data in a creative way can be very useful. So in this case, we went from this multi-channel EEG to these image representation, and this really helped us get better performance for new robustness for new patients and for the case where we have missing channels. So sometimes you have to think in creative ways about the data that you have. And I know the you know, deep learning promises are that you don't need to think about that. You just kind of feed in your raw data. And this is wonderful when you have you know, millions of examples. But in reality, when you're dealing with medical data, you have much smaller data, high variability, thinking carefully about how you're going to represent it can be very powerful, even if you don't have that very large scale of data. Um, so let me get back to the question of how we're going to use this um, in the context of uh, improving treatment design for personalized medicine. We haven't yet gone back and done the neurostimulation in the live animals and in the humans. And so in the epilepsy size, we're sort of at this stage where we now we have a better idea of how to do representation for um, live animals, but we haven't yet gone back and done the neurostimulation in real time. And one of the reasons we haven't is really this concern about the fact that we don't have a good initial policy. We don't have a seed strategy that we know is going to reduce seizures enough that we're going to have a signal in our reward function. 
And so without that, it's hard to launch um, and to know how many experiments we're going to do, um, to have to do to get a good strategy. What's our exploration space? And so we tackled this question of how to narrow down the exploration space in a slightly different context, in parallel with the project on epilepsy, and that's sort of the last piece that I will tell you about today really thinking carefully about how can we design the experiments through which we collect the data in order to make this feasible. And the reason I link this to this pretty broad topic on personalized medicine is because this issue of how to be efficient about collecting data, still allowing some amount of exploration, but in very constrained data cases, is one that's going to be, it's a problem that's going to be really important for the community to solve if we're going to make progress in this notion of personalized medicine. Because in many ways, we don't have many subjects for most, for many conditions. And so we have to be pretty careful about how we explore the space of treatments in an efficient way. And I would argue that in some sense, the classical approach to randomized clinical trial, which has a lot of value from a methodological point of view, for example, in terms of allowing us to establish causality, is a little bit limited when we move on to the context of personalized medicine. And so it's likely that we need to be more creative about how we set up our experiments to collect data and do so in a way that we can balance the standard concerns, right? Our standard concerns is, you know, to keep our subjects safe to get information, enough information out of the trials, but adding the third requirement that we have trials that are efficient, that we can do these trials with relatively or pool data from small sources and still be able to explore different options. And so let me be pretty clear about sort of the, the earlier part of the talk and the, the last little part. Um, both of them talk about adaptive strategies in the first part, what I was talking about is really adaptive treatment strategy. So I wanted to use reinforcement learning to select the best treatment and to customize the treatment, in that case, in real time to activities in the brain. So what I was interested in is improving longer term outcomes. And this last part, the question I'm asking is whether we can improve the data collection efficiency. And so during the exploration phase, can we be more efficient about um, data collection to learn as much as possible but using less data. And so this work is actually done in the context of um, treating cancer. In many ways the treatment of cancer is one area that has been much more open to having innovative methods for data collection. Um, in part is because many people who suffer from cancer, the outcomes are not that good and so there's more willingness to uh, be a little bit more adventurous or exploratory in what treatments are considered. And in the clinical side, they've embraced this. And so they already have started at looking at adaptive trials, in many cases, Bayesian trial design and so on, that allows some flexibility compared to the very classical, rigid, um, uh, randomized clinical trial framework. And so let's start with what I mean in this case by adaptive trial there's always usually going to be an initial exploration phase where in this case I'm showing you know five different treatments um, and the assumption is that if you know nothing about these treatments then you need to start by exploring a little bit each of these treatments so there's a, an initial budget in terms of um, number of uh, data points that are going to be attributed uniformly but the adaptive trial idea is really that as soon as you have preliminary information about the relative effectiveness of your different treatment arms, you can start rebalancing the distribution of your participants across the different arms in proportion to how promising the treatment arm is. So in this case, a treatment that seems to be completely futile wouldn't get any further data, and treatments that appear particularly promising or have confirmed effectiveness would get more um, patients attributed to it. In this case, I'm showing it without the personalization aspects in, in, um, in the picture. That will come a little bit later. We'll add personalization. But the, the, the main idea is that you're really trying to rebalance your probability distribution throughout the course of the trial in a way to be still effective in getting the data and getting the best outcomes you can for the participants in the trial. And so there's a few technical questions that come up here. One of them is how do you do this rebalancing? That's probably the core one 
of between the different arms as a function of the data you have. And the other one related to this is how do you incorporate the data that you get knowing that you're going to have different amounts of data for your different treatment arms. And so, as I mentioned, um, this question was explored in this case in a uh, cancer model. In particular, we were looking at uh, skin cancer. And this was also explored with an animal model, um, live animal models in this particular case, in partnership um, with researchers who have a, a wet lab doing this kind of work. And so there's the two phases that I just described. There's a first phase where we do pure exploration. There's a second phase where we do adaptive exploration. And so in the pure exploration phase, we're actually applying randomly chosen treatment. So this is akin to a normal randomized clinical trial. Treatment number one is to do absolutely nothing. Treatment number two is to apply a medication called 5-FU. And so this is applied on the skin of the animal at the location of the tumor. Option number three is to apply two medications jointly, 5-FU and imiquimode, both of which have some uh, evidence of effectiveness for this particular type of cancer. And option number four is actually to alternate between the two, uh, um, one on one day, the other one on the next day. And again, in this particular case, um, we didn't really have control over this initial exploration phase. This is data that we got from an initial uh, study where they had done equal um, distribution amongst the treatment arm. In this case, we had six different uh, mice, um, data from six different mice. On each of the mice, there was three different tumor sites that were initiated through uh, application of a carcinogenic agent. And so overall, over them, some tumors didn't quite grow, so we had a total of 13 different tumors for data analysis. And in many ways, I'm showing over here on this graph the evolution in terms of the size of the tumor. So we measure the gravity of the situation by a volumetric estimate of the tumor size, and this is essentially um, the cost function that we use. So we're trying to figure out which medication to apply to reduce the tumor size as much as possible. In particular, we're interested in figuring out whether we can, over time, alternate different treatments in a way that we get the best reduction. So there's some thoughts that possibly one of the two medications, 5-FU or Miquimode, is more effective for early stage tumors, and another one might be more effective for later stage tumors, and so trying to balance this strategy. So the personalization aspect in this particular work relates to the stage of growth of the tumor, so estimated by the size of the volumetric estimate of the size of the tumor. So using our 13 different tumors, we had different samples of treatments throughout the life um, of the animals. We had uh, 42 different cases where um, no action was taken, 60-some actions where we applied 5-FU, 20-some cases where imiquimode was applied, 30-some cases of applying both of them. So essentially, like the number of individual experiences that we have to train our reinforcement learning agent is on the order of 160 instances when we talk about experience tuple right state action reward this is about how much we have um, and from that we're trying to see if we can from the seed pure exploration data use that to start our adaptive exploration so we were given an additional budget of animals 10 animals in this case to look at adaptive exploration and see if during this adaptive exploration phase we could acquire more data so still learn, but in a way that was adaptive based on the information we had so far. And so we've phrased that in the reinforcement learning framework. The state is pretty simple, one-dimensional, just the state tumor volume in this case. The actions we have are down to four actions, so we didn't look at the combination or the interaction. We reduced it to something a little bit more simple. Sorry, we looked at the combination, but not the interaction. So doing nothing, applying 5-FU, applying a mode, applying both simultaneously, sort of your space of action that we're considering. A reward is the tumor reduction volume. And to formalize this problem of how to choose which action to apply to get more information, going back to the early graph here, right, there's a notion that you want to get more information about treatments that appear promising, but you also want to get more treatments going that seem more promising. So to balance these two different aspects, we cast the problem in the framework of contextual bandits. So in this case, the contextual bandit is defined by this set of states, which is our tumor volume, one-dimensional. We have our set of actions, which are the different arms of the bandit. 
and there is essentially a running value estimation over time, every time a new action is taken, that gives us the expected reward. So we're not yet, in this case, considering the sequence, the cumulative reward. We're just looking at the one-step reward, in this case, to simplify the setting. And the goal is to choose actions that are going to minimize regret compared to some optimal strategy. So an optimal strategy is the strategy you would have at the end after seeing all of the data that you've collected, not just the initial full exploration, but the full exploration plus the adaptive. If at that point you make a decision, what would it be? And we're comparing that with the decision that we're making in an adaptive way during the adaptive exploration phase. And so because we have a continuous context, um, we need to think about how to represent our posterior distribution over this reward. And so we use Gaussian process to model the reward function. There's a separate Gaussian process for each treatment choice. In this case, I'm showing just two different cases, but we have, in fact, four different cases. So the Gaussian process essentially allows us to estimate the function. And so in this case, this pink treatment seems to have good reward, good seizure volume reduction for small tumors, but it loses its ability for larger tumors, whereas the other one is definitely seems less effective for small tumors, um, but seems to be gaining in effectiveness as the tumors get bigger. But at this part, there still seems to be high uncertainty about which of the two medication might be the most effective. And so that gives us a way to um, configure both the current estimate of the reward as well as our level of certainty about it. Um, Within this bandit framework, when we um, ran an algorithm to select an arm in terms of the real-time decision of what's the next treatment that was going to be applied for a particular tumor on a particular mouse, we used this strategy called BESA, Best Arm Strategy Estimate, um, that was developed by Shai Manor, some of his colleagues. Um, if you haven't seen it and you're interested in bandit algorithms, I personally think it's a very nice um, way to do it. Essentially, it compares arms um, on the same size subsample. So if you have different number of experience for two different arms, it subsamples the number of experience for the arm with more experience so that you can compare both of them but with the same amount of information for both of them. And so there's nice um, results on that. This is a strategy we used. And again, it's a method that has very few hyperparameters to use. So for those of you who are familiar with the bandit, contextual bandit literature might have seen work on Thompson sampling, on uh, GPUCB, there tends to be a lot of susceptibility to some of these hyperparameter configuration, which BESA doesn't have. And so it makes it very robust in a case like this, where you can't do preliminary experiment to test out your hyperparameters. Um, so we had, and when I say n equals 10, this is the number of um, mouse we had for doing the evaluation of the adaptive strategy. As the first graph I'm showing over here, um, what's the life of the animal? So in this case, our reward function is the reduction in tumor volume, but the experimental protocol specifies that we can actually keep on using the mouse uh, to a particular time, and that time is determined by the size of the tumors. So at some point, if the tumors get too large, we must terminate the experiment and kill the mouse. Um, and so essentially, the longer the mouse lives, the more data we can get for exploration. So it's the right um, metric for really seeing how good we are doing with exploration. And so in terms of life expectancy for our participants, our subjects in this case, if there's no treatment at all, the average um, life expectancy is uh, slightly below 50 days. If 5-FU alone is applied, which is the standard best treatment of care for this particular type of skin cancer, we're looking at about um, <clears throat> 80 days or so. If there's a randomized policy applied, so this is a pure exploration policy, also just a little bit better than 50 days, but essentially with very high variance. And over here you see what's the lifetime of the mouse in the case where you have an adaptive strategy. So this is a strategy that runs the bandit algorithm that it aimed as balancing this exploration, exploitation trade-off. And so it seems on expectation to be doing better than just 5-FU. And so we've learned something about how to treat patients, and we seem to have um, done better than the standard of care. But uh, quite honestly, the, the confidence intervals are very large in this particular case. Now here I'm mixing up all the mouse that went through my adaptive exploration phase. But in reality, when we did these experiments, um, we didn't run all 10 mouse in parallel. We actually ran groups of two or three mice at a time, and after every two or three mice, we would re-update the uh, 
the bandit in terms of what data we had to estimate the Gaussian process. And so if I separate my data according to each of the groups during my experiment, the first group lived essentially not much better, in, on average worse than if they had had no treatment. The second group, where we had incorporated the data that was learned from the bandit in the first group, lived significantly longer. The third group, there was two mouse in that group, they both lived exactly 123 days. Um, that happens sometimes. And the last group over here, three mice in this case, um, live well beyond 125 days. And so w what we're seeing is that by using this adaptive strategy, we're still able to learn a good strategy. These mice are living much longer than these ones over there and still get the information we need. There's still some exploration in these particular trials. We're just rebalancing the probabilities between the different arms based on our Gaussian process information, so our estimate of the outcome of each of these arms. Um, so just in closing, a, a couple final comments. I, I would really call on those of you who are here today to not be afraid of working with small data. If you're working in machine learning, to not only work in cases where you have large data, I think there's significant work, significant in many dimension work that can be done in very, very small data regime, and your goal should really just be about um, trying to do the best you can with the data you have. And I know how tempting it is, especially as a call out to the graduate students in the room, to just look at the benchmarks and the data set and just go and try to, you know, beat the heck out of the latest benchmark. Um, but I would encourage all of you to go and meet colleagues across the university who have interesting problems and may have little data, um, but problems with high impact and try to engage in some of these um, problems. When you try to do that, I think possibly um, the other take-home lesson I would say is that um, don't necessarily fall to always using the best and the most impressive methods from the literature. Um, this is a talk that has very little deep learning. There's a little bit of it. Um, in many cases, the methods that we're using are like 1980s machine learning, maybe 1990s machine learning. Not terribly sophisticated, um, but um, combined in some clever ways with some of the more recent findings. So in this case, the bandit, multi-contextual bandit, has been known for decades. We're using a BESA strategy to select the arm that's been known for a couple of years. And so trying to take a broad spectrum of view on what are the methods that you might use. And in particular, I can only um, emphasize this, um, I must emphasize this strongly, using methods that are really robust to hyperparameter specification when you're dealing with small data is particularly important. There's a great deal of open problems that come up when you do this kind of work. This is just a quick list of some of them that we've worked on sort of tangentially to doing this. Um, these are all open problems in a sense in machine learning and so it's not because you're looking at a particular problem um, where you think you're using um, existing methods that you're not going to do innovation on the technical side. Working with that data gives you opportunities and we've done work on all of these uh, projects um, coming out and we will continue to do work on many of these projects as we, um, we move forward. Um, along my path through this work, I've had the good fortune to work with many, many very generous collaborators. For many of them, um, the projects that I described uh, here was really asking them to take a step away from the path that they were engaging in, both my students on the AI side as well as my collaborators on the clinical side. So I think it's worth um, thanking them and acknowledging this. And I do hope many of them, uh, many of you, find similar colleagues on your path. And I will close it here and just encourage you to go out and find interesting problems to solve. Thank you. The, the false positive in terms of when I measured my, my accuracy in terms of controlling the seizures, 
Yeah, so we have a team of electrophysiologists that we work with to do these kinds of experiments. They're the same kinds of people that would do the annotation. So if a person comes in, in the clinic, you get their EEG reading, several pages of it, they do that annotation. These are the people that we ask to do this analysis. It can be, I wouldn't use it in a standard, like in a, a model-based way, but certainly it, it identifies the places that need further investigation. Yes, and so it, thinking more about observational data in this particular case. Yes, I think there's really interesting ways to think of how do you use observational data, but not just in a predictive way, but to possibly rebalance these kinds of models. I think that conversation is wide open and, and something that we're going to see a lot of interesting discussion in coming years. Yeah. I have a quick question for you. Um, how can you formulate your data in the reinforcement learning paradigm before you have the chance to really interact with the, for example, the, the EEG monitor yourself and to make actions? How can a reinforcement learning algorithm go about gleaning information from uh, static data? Mm -hmm. So in many ways, this goes to the question of what's the right representation? For, for, for your work. And, and in cases where we have so little data, it's very hard to first pick the right representation and then figure out how to do the control. Um, we rely extensively on prior models, and models come in all sorts of shapes and forms. And so I would say the work that we did, for example, on doing automatic uh, seizure classification with human data, we're using that as a preliminary study to tell us what's the right representation. And then when we go back and try to do the neurostimulation on the live animals, we're going to use that representation. And so we do this transfer between different types of model in a way to inform that. But it's a very hard question to both do your representation learning and your policy learning simultaneously when you're dealing with very small amounts of data. Okay, in the interest of time, we have to end here. Uh, you can interact with uh, Joel after the talk. Uh, let's once again thank Joel for the very enlightening talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much.